Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to deliver this lecture celebrating the legacy of a remarkable man who in the short span of half a century had a profound impact on the culture of his people, the history of his region, and the literature of his language. He helped forge the modern identity of the Arabs, founded the modern mass media there, and brought culture to the broad public as he pioneered the use of the novel in Arabic. He was a man of letters who understood and publicized science, a man of the Christian faith who had a profound knowledge of Islam and the history of the Muslim peoples and helped bring that history to life for generations of Muslims, including myself. Let me start with a brief overview of Zaidan and his times. It was a remarkable period of change and transformation called the period of the Dahda, or the Arab Renaissance, or the Arab Awakening, to use the title coined by George Antonius in his 1938 book. Georgi Zaidan, I submit, was one of the artisans of that societal prise de conscience. Like an unchecked cancer, bad governance had turned the once mighty Ottoman Empire into the sick man of Europe. Ottoman ossification had brought the Arab and Muslim worlds to a new low. The jolt of reawakening was to come in the form of the French invasion of Egypt in 1798. After the French defeat and withdrawal, chaos reigned under the nominal suzerainty of the Ottomans until Muhammad Ali took the reins of power in Egypt and started his ambitious development and modernization programs. The momentum of reform was to continue. And by the second half of the 19th century, a true movement to modernize Egypt was underway. It was in that world of transformation and transition that Zaidan would flourish. He was to make a signal contribution to this Arab Renaissance, the Nahda. Indeed, he is considered by some, like Philip, to have been the archetypical member of the Arab Nahda at the end of the 19th century. Now, two strands come together in this Nahda, this transformation. One is admiration for European achievements that promote emulation of the West, and the other an insistence on reviving the roots of the culture of the East. Each of these, in turn, has two identifiable strands. In looking to the West, there is a desire to fully emulate it in terms of technology, modernity, and much more. But a resistance to full Westernization in terms of refusing to promote values that would undermine our own cultural roots and nascent national identity. And again, when it comes to reviving the Eastern identity and cultural roots, two strands can be identified. Those who wanted a pan-Islamic revival, as championed by Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, and those who wanted an Arab revival, as championed by al-Kawakibi. It was part of the genius of Georgi Zaidan that he epitomized the weaving together of these four strands as few have been able to do before or since. In so doing, he responded to a deep, latent desire among Arab and Muslim intellectuals and reformers. But Zaidan was much more than a contributor to the intellectual debates of his time. He transformed society by helping build the Arab media, the key instrument to educate the public in those days. And he was also an important literary figure, a pioneer of the novel and a historian of Islamic civilization. Born on the 14th of December, 1861, in Beirut to an Orthodox Christian family of limited means, Zaidan was forced to drop out of school after two years of elementary education to help his father run his restaurant business. Yet his enthusiasm for education and his keenness on improving himself 
finally got him into the Syrian Protestant College as a medical student, which he eventually left after supporting his professor's right to academic freedom against the administration. He then went to Cairo to study medicine, but finally opted for a career in writing, which created the legend that he became. In 1891, he married Maryam, a girl he loved, and they had three children, Emil, Asma, and Shukri, born in 1893, 1895, and 1900, respectively. He was devoted to his family and to his work. He died in July 1914 at his desk, completing the last tome of his work on the history of Arab literature. He was only 52 years old. So let's discuss several facets of the great Georgi Zaidan. Zaidan, the builder of the Arab press. Zaidan, the intellectual. Zaidan, the activist reformer of the Nahda. Zaidan, the literary author. And Zaidan, the man. Then I would like to conclude with a few comments about why I think that Zaidan and his thinking are both pertinent and relevant for our times, the times that have been dubbed part of the Arab Spring. It is difficult for people today to imagine a world without the internet and without cell phones and television. And even those who, like myself, grew up without these modern wonders which we take for granted, it is almost impossible to imagine a world without newspapers, magazines, and books. Yet up to the early part of the 19th century, that was the situation in Egypt. And except for a few lucky readers in Lebanon, it was so for the rest of the Arab world as well. A handful of men were to change all that, and Georgi Zaidan was one of them. Following the introduction of the printing press in Egypt in 1820, and the official journal in 1828, the printed word began to spread throughout Egypt and much of the Arab world. Albert Horani paints the picture vividly. There grew up a new generation accustomed to reading. For those who had been educated to a high level in Arabic, a new literature was being produced. Apart from school texts, books were less important in this period than newspapers and periodicals, which began to play a large part in the 1860s and the 1870s. Among the periodicals of ideas, opening windows onto the culture, science, and technology of the West, were two produced by Lebanese Christians in Cairo, Al Muqtataf by Aqub Sarouf and Faris Nimr and Al Hilal by Georgi Zaidan. It was these same people who would promote public education and public debate. They were to be the primary artisans of the Nahda. We all now recognize that the printing press, and especially the journal and the newspaper, were the major instruments for public debates in the Nahda. Every single member of the Nahda was a writer, a publisher, an editor, and or owner of newspapers and journals. Al-Hilal with Al-Muqtataf and Al-Manar became the highest intellectual authorities within the Nahda movement. But Zaidan, the self-made man achieved what none of his contemporaries was able to do. He created a lasting institution. This was the unique strength of Georgi Zaidan, that far from simply creating something that he dominated, and dominated he did, he successfully institutionalized Al-Hilal so that it survived him by a century and is today the oldest continuously publishing cultural journal in the Arab world. He is rightly considered to have been one of a handful of individuals who created modern Arab journalism. Zaidan's commitment was to educate the public, not just to produce a literary magazine primarily for entertainment. Indeed, his foreword to the first issue of Al-Hilal 
crystallizes his commitment to educating society in a liberal, pluralistic fashion, which he considers a duty. He says, our plan is to be true to our objective, honest in our tone, and to endeavor to do our best for the task we have set out to perform. To achieve this, we must necessarily support all contemporary writers and intellectuals from every realm and corner. What we aim at is to elicit the interest of the majority to read what we write, approve of it, and forgive us our mistakes. If we accomplish this, we will have achieved satisfaction and will thus endeavor harder to attain what we consider our duty. Joji Zaidan was the founder, writer, editor-in-chief, manager, and printer of Al-Hilal magazine. His dedication to making Al-Hilal a successful, popular periodical that would inevitably influence public opinion and help educate the people made him exert great effort to maintain its excellence, high circulation rate, and its high quality. He turned it into a platform for the works of distinguished authors, pioneers of Arabic literature, including giants like Hussein Haikal, Ta Hussein, Muhammad Farid Wajdi, Ali Al Jarim, Abbas Mahmoud Al Aqad, Mustafa Lutf Al Manfaluti, and Ahmed Amin. And because of that, Al Hilal achieved great fame and survives his death by many years till now. And it became a towering institution of journalism. But to achieve that popularity and continuity, Zaidan had noted from the beginning that while he had to educate the public in what it did not know, he had to respect the taste, traditions, and moral values of the readers, even while trying to change them. Al-Tamawi cites him as saying, the writer writes for the citizens of a country, and he relies on them to read what he has written. Another major point of strength that Zaidan brought to Al-Hilal was the fact that he expanded the cultural scene to include more than just literature. And starting with science, he made sure to offer his readers a variety of interesting, informative, and intellectually stimulating areas of knowledge. As Azat observes, at the time Al-Hilal was first issued, culture in Egypt was limited to literature. The new periodical gave it a wider and more comprehensive meaning. It included history, philosophy, science, sociology, politics, and economics. Thus merging intellectual thought with art and science and philosophy. Zaidan believed in the importance of education for all of society, in the broadest sense of the word education. While it could be argued that this was out of self-interest, I personally do not share that view and rather believe that Zaidan, like several of his reformer colleagues, all artisans of the Nahda, believed that education was the best means of achieving societal progress. To stay in circulation also required navigating the shoals of political censorship of his day. Confronting Western occupation in the Middle East and North Africa was no easy feat, but Georgi Zaidan managed it with a delicate balance between cultural and political activism. But beyond Zaidan, the journalist, the media mogul, and the editor is Zaidan, the intellectual. While many would consider him to be primarily a historian or novelist or journalist, the sum total of his contributions represented an enormously distinctive, effective, and coherent body of work that made an enormous difference to the entire Arab world. His views on many topics were influential with his contemporaries and for subsequent generations. What can we say about the thinking of this self-made man? While it was undoubtedly multifaceted, I will try to limit my remarks to a few of the many areas where he made important contributions. Specifically, let me address his attitudes towards science, culture, 
and women. On science and rationality, let us say first that he had a profound belief in rationality and science as the means of progress in the future. Indeed, he had defended the right to teach evolution when Darwin was still unacceptable to the Christian church. Brugman notes that Zaidan supported avant-garde ideas and believed in the value of science to the extent that he had to pay a price for that. When in 1882, as a young medical student at the American College of Beirut, he supported a certain Dr. Lewis who had given lectures on Darwin's theory of evolution, Zaidan, among others, was refused admittance into the then still Christian Protestant University. George Zaidan believed that the scientific approach was the key to education more generally. This carried over into his work as a journalist where he notes that whoever has been exposed to an education must understand science. Zaidan had been exposed to education in medicine, chemistry, mathematics and pharmacology. And he wrote about many scientific issues such as radium, Rongton's x-rays, tuberculosis and limestone. Zaidan saw science as an important dimension of culture. And in his view, culture also included history, philosophy, sociology, politics and economics, above and beyond science, thus merging intellectual thought with art and science with philosophy. His commitment to science and getting the facts right, noted by Al-Tamawi and Philippe among many, meant that he also wanted to apply this approach to understanding one's own culture. So what did he do about culture? How did that scientific approach reflect itself in his writings on culture? Now, as I said at the outset, he was able to weave together the four strands of westernization cultural authenticity as well as Arabism and Islam. Now these last two strands involved important and distinct political projects to which I will devote the next part of this discussion. But allow me here to focus on westernization and cultural authenticity. Zaidan was certainly open to the ideas of the West though he was not uncritical of some of the aspects of what he saw there. In fact, the Anani cites Zaidan's list of do's and don'ts in cultural borrowing from the West. He says, in the civilization of France and that of other European parts, there are many virtues that we should borrow and benefit from, but it also has vices that should be avoided. The virtues that we will do well to borrow from are one, recognition of duty. Two, punctuality and not wasting time. Three, refinement of the manners of the commonality through true education. Four, the education and edification of women. Five, the promotion of education and the expansion of the study of letters. And six, hard work. Now, for the faults of that civilization, the most important to remember of those are excess of freedom and using it wrongly. Two, whatever contradicts our sense of oriental decency, notwithstanding the adoption of a measure of knowledge and education that is suitable to our customs. And three, indifference to religion. For that is the cornerstone of ruin. So this was the list of do's and don'ts that Georgi Zaidan adopted. For him, cultural authenticity meant that he had to define what constituted the oriental roots that he felt needed to be affirmed in the face of westernization in order to be able to develop our own renaissance, our own nahta. Zaidan was able to make a profound commitment to the notion of Arabism as distinct from relating exclusively to Egyptians or Phoenicians, even though he recognized the contributions of these cultural strands. It was for him the common language of Arabic that established a true bond between Arabs. But with Arab culture, he saw the influence of Islamic civilization 
as a major factor giving Arab culture a content and depth beyond its own linguistic reach and contributing to the formation of the Arab identity. And though he shunned political activism, he was nonetheless concerned with Arab history and wrote openly of an Arab nation. But what about women? Well, political reform brings into focus the issue of the status of women. And Zaidan undoubtedly believed in the education of women. And he says, no two intelligent people differ in the matter of the education of women. But he still shows a certain wariness towards the full emancipation of women. Indeed, he writes with wistfulness about the more timid and tame oriental women of his time compared to the brazenness which he was witnessing in Paris. Now his views on the status of women were more conservative than those of some of his contemporaries, such as Qasim Amin. And the Lanani further notes that as conservatism regarding female emancipation tends to be habitually associated with Islam, we will do well to remember that George Zaydan was a Christian. So where does all this leave us? On the whole, this prismatic author and publisher, historian and public educator, made a major contribution to the culture of the Arab Renaissance, the Nahda. As one of his successors, Muhammad Farid Wajdi said, if I were to count the unique personalities that have appeared in the Middle East in the last 50 years, those who have enriched it with their writings and ideas, I find myself obliged to put Jorge Zaidan at the forefront. Indeed, deservedly so. So what was this Arab Nahda and cultural and political project? The cultural and political project of the pan-Arab Nahda did not only have to cope with the issues of westernization and cultural authenticity, it also had to cope with the rival project of the pan-Islamic revival. It had to answer what constituted an Arab identity that would transcend the identities of Egyptians, Phoenicians, Iraqis, and Syrians, so on. Now, Egypt detached itself from the Arab movement and evolved a nationalist policy of her own. The change had begun in the 1870s and during the reign of the Khedive Ismail, when that ruler's extravagance and his entanglement with European finance brought about a wave of popular discontent. Hitherto, the movement of ideas in Egypt so far as the Arab cultural revival and the birth of the Arab national consciousness went, had marched hand in hand with the same process in Syria, and the lead given by one country evoked a ready response from the other. And Zaidan, who straddled the Levant and Egypt, was firmly committed to the Arab identity. And for him, the Arabic language was the key. For Zaidan, the existence of the Arabic language as a functioning means of communication and information for society was proof that an Arab bond existed, said many observers. Now, in his ability to transcend geographic affinities as well as religious ones, and to emphasize language as the cornerstone for defining his cultural worldview, Zaidan was not only progressive, but he also rejected the racial or ethnic basis on which other intellectuals in Europe and elsewhere were building their view of society and politics. Zaidan is considered to have been an architect of the modern Arab identity. And as Philippe rightly says, Zaidan is considered to have laid the foundation for a pan-Arab national identity. Here it is important to note that his Arabism is not of the extreme and chauvinistic kind supported by people like Mustafa Sadiq al-Rafai, a judgment held by no less eminent a person than Muhammad Hussein Haikal Pasha. Now, on Islamic civilization, Zaidan was a distinguished historian. He undoubtedly read Western sources and admired the precision and method that European Orientalism brought to the task of interpreting history. 
But while, like other Arab intellectuals in the 19th and early 20th century, he was profoundly influenced by the methods of European research, he also had enormous mastery of Arab and Muslim history, and his historical knowledge came most often from Arab writers whom he also criticized severely. The balance of these various influences is best seen in his writing. And it is amazing that this largely self-taught man should have produced the first modern historiography of Islamic civilization. That enormous multi-volume work would open the door to successors, most notably Ahmad Amin. In fact, no less a figure than Salama Musa notes that Georgi Zaidan was a self-made man culturally as well as in matters of finance. He was the first who, in our modern age, devoted his life to studying Islamic history. He wrote a great many historical novels in addition to his major work, The History of Islamic Civilization. Writing the latter was a pioneer's task by which he opened the way for all the historical studies that came after him in the past 20 or 30 years appearing in ever-increasing numbers. How true. Now, others were seeking to revive a pan-Islamic project as a rival to the Arab Nahda. But Zaidan remained true to his Arab cultural project, even though he did more than any other to link it with the content of Islamic civilization. Beyond his masterwork on Islamic civilization, it would be as novelist that he would introduce Islamic and Arab history to a very wide public. While many thinkers, both Muslims and Christians, shaped the Arab nationalism that emerged with the Nahda, Zaidan was truly a founding figure. Al-Tamawi goes further and says that George Zaidan is considered one of the greatest guides of Arab culture in its modern renaissance. Well, what about this pan-Islamic revival? Well, the Ottoman Empire could no longer provide a viable model for those who saw power and modernity embodied in the West with its nationalism and imperialist tendencies. Yet, that old Muslim empire had been capable of accommodating a plethora of local identities precisely because the Muslim faith was embracing so vast a territory with so many cultures and subcultures and so many ethnicities and religious minorities. The National Parliament, the Ottoman Majlis al-Milli, provided some sort of recognition and even some channels of communication to the sublime port and to the centralized decision-making structure where there was a need for it. Local affairs were largely dealt with locally. Now, some were intent on reforming the Ottoman pan-Islamic project, and intellectuals from Afghani to Muhammad Abdu to Rashid Rida provided the intellectual framework for such political endeavors. If Zaidan differed with these and others on the pan-Islamic versus the Arab dimension of his cultural project, he shared with many his belief that education of the public would be the key to modernizing the backward Eastern societies. And as Musawi aptly puts it, Georgi Zaidan's contributions are in line with the sense of national commitment and an intellectual moral responsibility to participate in the education of the public. Ah, the education of the public as the key to progress. But the political dimensions of the pan-Islamic project were to continue for quite a while. And even until today, echoes and variations are found in the works and actions of intellectuals and politicians from Iran to Morocco, from Pakistan to Turkey. And while Egypt remains at the heart of that debate, even as the debate remains at the heart of Egypt. However, I believe that the polarization that we now witness between liberal secularist reformers and pan-Islamic revivalists 
denies a meeting ground that has a long and distinguished intellectual history and tradition, which my colleagues and I at the Library of Alexandria are trying to revive by reissuing the classics of the last 200 years. However, even though I allude to this in a few comments about the Arab Spring, this important topic is really beyond this discussion, which I want to keep focused on Georgi Zaidan and his work. Now, the 20th century was to bring many transformations, to list but a few. The changes within the Ottoman Empire before the First World War, the war itself, and the famous Arab revolt against the Ottomans, supported by Lawrence of Arabia and aborted by Sykes-Picot Agreement, the 1919 revolution in Egypt, and the subsequent emergence of a liberal regime with the 1923 constitution, the destruction of the Ottoman Empire and the emergence of modern Turkey under Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, and the abolition of the caliphate. And then Palestine and the military coups that came after the Second World War and the autocratic regimes that ruled the Arab world till the current waves of revolutionary movements which we collectively refer to as the Arab Spring. All of that was to have a profound impact on the subsequent evolution of the ideas originally championed by Georgi Zaidan during his brief lifetime. But discussion of these issues is again beyond the scope of this current lecture. But two observations are worth making here. First, since there was competition between the pan-Islamic and the Arab cultural projects, the changes in the Ottoman Empire before its final collapse and the impact of these changes on the Nahda are worth noting. In fact, reformers in both camps, the Arab and pan-Islamic ones, were encouraged showing that they had a substantial common ground. Annie-Laure Dupont's observations on the impact of the 1908 Ottoman constitution said, the return of the Ottoman constitution in 1908 was immediately perceived as a revolution in Qilab and was widely commented in the Arab press, not only in newspapers, but also in cultural educational reviews such as Hilal and Al-Manar both edited in Cairo by Syrian Ottoman subjects, Georgi Zaidan and Muhammad Rashid Rida. Until then, Zaidan and Rida had not been directly involved in political matters. But as advocates of the reform and progress of the society at large, they felt encouraged in their mission by the advent of a constitutional regime in Istanbul and the granting of new rights. They actually saw in these the triumph of their ideas and ideals, and both were typical of the modernist or reformist movement in Egypt and the Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire and its shared values as well as its various trends. Zaidan and Rida claimed to educate individuals and society. Right on, madame. Now, if we think in terms of was it a call for political reform or was it a call for revolution? It was not a call for violent revolution or political upheaval that these enlightened men sought. Indeed, both Georgi Zaidan and Rashid Rida believed in education and somehow feared social change. They wanted a revolution without a revolution. To them, liberty was largely a state of mind. Zaidan remained committed to educating the public very broadly, not just on political issues. And in furthering this cause of educating the public more generally, he saw clearly the importance of bringing valuable, affordable knowledge to the general reader. Thus, in 1894, Zaidan issued the series Al-Hilal historical novels, which were mainly translated works meant for the general public and sold at a low price by his very own publishing house, Dar al-Hilal. With these novels, he aimed to compete with other works that he viewed 
they were not in line with the general habits and tradition of the culture he was defending and the cause he was advancing. Towards the end of his life, Zaidan added to his interests reflections on what made a society distinctive and what made power legitimate. But he remained overall committed to his great cultural project and did not succumb to the siren song of participating in the manipulation and exercise of political power. But then what can we say about the literary work of Georgi Zaidan? Georgi Zaidan's instrument was the pen. He was a writer. He pioneered the use of the historical novel and indirectly the novel in general as a genre of Arab literature. His 22 novels were popular and enjoy until today an unbroken fame. Indeed, Zaidan, despite his short literary life, which did not exceed 22 years, carved for himself a distinguished place among Arab writers. And his name has been forever recognized by everyone. If he was not of the literary stature comparable to later figures like Ta Hussein, Abbas al Haqqad, or Naguib Mahfouz, he was the precursor the pioneer who revolutionized the Arab novel and paved the way for them. And as Albert Hurani noted, Georgi Zaidan did more than any other writer of the Nahda to create a consciousness of the Arab past by his histories and still more by his series of historical novels modeled on those of Scott and creating a romantic image of the past as Scott had done. But beyond the societal impact of Zaidan's novels, his literary work in these novels had certain characteristics that set them apart. Now, as the attention to historical context is pronounced, much more so than the treatment of character and plot, which is usually a love story with a happy ending. Now, La Walid Hamarna comments on his literary style saying, many critics have observed that his novels are composed of two basic elements. The first element consists of the historical background, which can be subdivided into two types. Historical time, usually composed of long passages, sometimes with footnotes and references to historical works that provide the reader with an elaborate temporal and spatial context. And a second type, associated with space, where Zaidan provides elaborate and detailed descriptions of cities or areas in which the action takes place. The second element in Zaidan's novel is the love story. This typically involves a man and a woman who fall in love, then are separated by circumstances only to meet again, and in most cases come together in a happy ending. The plot structure can thus be considered closed and dominated by historical facts. Now, these distinctive characteristics that have been outlined by Hamarna and this approach of Zaidan can be contrasted to Western novelists of the time as well as those that followed him in the Arab world and that enables us to appreciate his political and cultural purposes, not just his literary achievements. But in the area of literary and linguistic studies, Zaidan was an innovator. His three books, Al-Alfaz al-Arabiya wa al-Falsafa al, al, al 1886, Tariq al-Lugha al-Arabiya in 1904, and Tariq Adab al-Lugha al-Arabiya published in, towards the end of his life between 1910 and 1913, are considered milestones in the development of the Arabic language. Now, as a leader in the Arab Nahda movement, Zaidan's interest in promoting, analyzing, and upholding the value of the Arabic language meant for him a triumph for Arab Renaissance. And Philippe observes that the members of the Nahda with Zaidan in the forefront changed the paradigm of the language. The language became symbol and program at the same time. Symbol for the existence of an Arab nation consisting of all Arabic speaking people and the program for establishing practical communication between all Arabs. It became the basis for a pan-Arab national identity. 
Zaidan's great achievements on the literary, historical, and linguistic fronts bear witness to his individual achievement, but also serve to underscore his dedication to his goal and dream of establishing the Arab Nahda project of which he was a major pillar. The Zaidan project was a great success. He succeeded in promoting historical knowledge among the non-intellectual elite and thus provided the broad grounding for a common Arab identity. As noted earlier, no less an authority than Horani remarks that perhaps it was Georgi Zaidan who did more than any other person to create a consciousness of the Arab past by his histories and still more by his series of historical novels. Zaidan wrote in clear and simple prose. It was a distinctive style that no less a stylist than Manfaluti admired this pellucid prose. But beyond style, his writings contributed massively to the development of modern standard Arabic, a simplified written language which is today understood by all literate Arabs regardless of dialect. Zaidan remains a towering figure in the history of modern literature. His legacy endures. It has stood the test of time. More importantly, Zaidan, the novelist, has had a major impact on Arab letters and on global literature. For it is through his work that the novel was introduced into Arabic literature. Musa confirms this by saying, that it was with the appearance of the eminent writer Georges Zaidan that the Arab novel, and in particular the historical novel, was brought to fruition. Now, Zaidan's impact on the development of the genre in Arabic cannot be overestimated. Many, such as Philippe, note that he was a true pioneer. He paved the way for his successors, who in the last hundred years produced phenomenal developments, culminating with Naguib Mahfouz, being awarded the first Nobel Prize in Literature for an Arab novelist. Zaidan, with his serialized novel encompassing Arabic Islamic history, was the major pioneer of the Arab novel, and his novels were popular and are still popular today in an unbroken series of readers' rediscovery. Zaidan himself recognized that there were many types of novels thereby emphasizing that the genre he had selected was to suit his own purpose. There is no doubt that he selected the historical novel as a means of promoting, no, creating a new Arab consciousness. He was, of course, a specialist in Arab and Muslim history, but that is not the sole reason he chose that genre. After all, he had broad knowledge of many aspects of literature. In fact, Musa underlines that in his view, where writers like Scott and Dumas only used historical settings for their characters, Zaidan used the novel and its characters as a means of teaching history to the public. I fully agree with that observation. Now, to emphasize that point, we must recognize that the challenge for Zaidan was not how to integrate historical knowledge into the novel's narrative, as much as how to spice up the historical narrative by using the fictional characters almost as props. The novel was not a means of exploring the human frailties and sensibilities of the characters the author created, rather the unfolding historical events were the real story. And thus, in his historical novels, Zaidan portrayed most of his fictitious characters as simple and fixed being almost passive instruments for the unfolding of an already determined general historical sequence. And often he was compelled to create fictitious characters and tie them in somehow with the real ones to lend the novel the necessary excitement and adventure. Now he could not do this with authentic historical characters. So in the end, what did those historic novels amount to? They certainly pioneered the use of the novel in the Arab world, and they certainly were a marvelous tool that introduced generations of Arabs and Muslims to their history. 
and created the Arab public's consciousness of a collective past and hence a common bond, if not an outright commitment to a common future. What a set of remarkable achievements. Who is this Georgi Zaidan who did all of that? So let me now turn to Zaidan the man. Georgi Zaidan, a man of dedication and rectitude, a self-made man, and largely a self-taught intellectual of encyclopedic breadth. He was a man whom everybody loved. There are many great testimonials by his contemporaries and his successors. Ahmad Amin, Abbas al-Haqqad and others. Muhammad Hussein Haikal told us that Zaidan was the first to tackle this history of Arabic literature in a way that resembles modern research in its absence from bias and the seeking of truth for its own sake. Indeed, Zaidan's integrity and achievements have won him the admiration of many, as Bishara Takla's comment after his death clearly demonstrates. In truth, if historians measured his age to his legacy, they will realize that the owner of Al-Hilal was 100 years old when he was only in his 50s when he departed. But perhaps it is Emil Amin who captures it best in his brief summary statement. We can summarize his life by saying that this man, Christian by religion and Islamic by culture, who has succeeded through his fiction to introduce Islamic history with ease and lucidity, highlighting the aspects of tolerance and rationalism in it, represented a bridge for positive connection between East and West. What a legacy. What is the significance of that legacy today? Well, Zaidan died before the 1919 revolution in Egypt and the liberal age that was to emerge between the wars up to 1952 in Egypt. His thinking and contributions had a profound impact on that period. Today, following the totalitarian systems that ruled the Arab world for the second half of the 20th century, we are witnessing the Arab Spring, a new revolt, a new revolution, a new page in the history of the Arabs. Is Zaidan's thinking still relevant for a democratic Arab society today? Or is it only of historical interest for a few scholars? Can the Nahda as the liberal and national base for Arab thought and politics serve as an inspiration for the unfolding events set in motion by the revolutionary waves of the Arab Spring in 2011 and beyond? Is it a viable alternative to fundamentalist tendencies? Today, the polarization in our countries, the Arab and Muslim world, generally is between those who seek the revival of Muslim culture while others choose to follow the path of Western-style political liberalism and pluralistic democracy. Both parties imagine that there is no meeting ground possible. But that is not true. From its antecedents in the modernization efforts of Muhammad Ali and Rifa'at Tahtawi to the Nahda of Georgi Zaidan and others, the meeting ground of the two currents is indeed a Nahda for the 21st century, a new renaissance for the Arab world and through it a broader renaissance of the Muslim world. Thus Zaidan's legacy has a major relevance today. He was a Christian scholar of Islam, an Arab nationalist who saw the importance of the Islamic component of Arab culture and identity. He revived the understanding of the Muslim tradition while championing modernity, science, and westernization. He saw educating the white public as primarily the elite's responsibility. He recognized the importance of an open exchange of ideas and practiced it by creating the best intellectual forum for such exchanges, Al-Hilal, the longest lived and still surviving cultural journal in Arabic. What can we conclude by? This is but a very brief overview of some of Georgi Zaidan's many accomplishments. It was a remarkably productive professional life of some three decades 
So it is most fitting that we should celebrate and honor the life of a man who with deceptive ease went from striving to success, from ambition to achievement, and from humble beginnings to the heights of recognition. Throughout the Arab world, he is remembered for his glorious contribution to the modernization of values and the values of modernization. A man of many facets, he was an artisan of the Nahda, the Renaissance of the Arab world. He championed all the right causes, from the rationality of science to the romance of history, from the importance of knowing the cultural heritage of the past to the value of creating the cultural heritage of the future. Georgi Zaidan was a giant among his contemporaries and successive generations of Arab readers rediscover him with joy. Such is the legacy he gave his people and the world. Thank you.